We are excited to have Dr. Yana Barbalat join us to do a talk on the prevention of recurrent urinary tract infections. Uh, Dr. Barbalat completed her medical school and residency training in neurological surgery at Rutgers Medical School and a fellowship training in voiding dysfunction and female pelvic medicine at Columbia University Medical Center. She is currently in practice in Massachusetts and specializes in recurrent urinary tract infections, overactive bladder, pelvic floor dysfunction, and incontinence. Without further ado, uh, I pass the presentation over to Dr. Barbalat. Awesome, thank you, Derek, and thanks for having me. I'm really, really excited to do this talk. Um, I feel like, you know, there's so many fields of medicine right now with so much progress, and the field, the world of recurrent UTIs is really no different. Uh, where right now we're just learning so much um, when it comes to, you know, the microbiome of the bladder and the vagina, and there's a lot of new kind of holistic approaches coming out to management of recurring UTIs. And so I'm really excited to sort of be part of it all. And I really do enjoy my patients, um, my patient population with recurring UTIs, because I really think that these people um, get really frustrated and it's really nice to be able to help them. So I wanted to sort of spread that knowledge and talk today about um, prevention of recurring UTIs, um, a look at the American Neurological Association guidelines on um, UTIs. So and, and a look at my practice. What do I do practically? Now, um, the AUA actually came out with guidelines in 2019. Prior to that, the American Neurological Association did not have guidelines on management of recurring UTIs, which is sort of almost funny, but we didn't. Um, and so it's really nice to have a set of guidelines now to go by um, and sort of to give physicians direction of what really, you know, has some clinical, you know, what has been shown to be effective, what has not been shown to be effective, all packaged up nicely for us to use. Um, so here we go. Okay. So, you know, first of all, why do we care about UTIs? Well, you know, urinary tract infections are the most common outpatient infection in the United States. And, you know, a lot of UTIs are e easily treated and patients recover quickly, but you definitely do see a lot of cases of pyelonephritis, patients end up, you know, septic in the hospital, and UTIs can lead to even death, right? So UTIs are important to, to know about and, and to manage well. Um, also, there's a huge financial burden of, um, of UTIs. It's $2 billion in the U.S. alone, basically, per year. Um, so just a few terms that I want to get out there, because I think these terms are really important, and many of you may already be familiar with this, but basically UTIs fall into two categories. The first one is uncomplicated UTIs. So uncomplicated UTIs are those that happen in healthy, non-pregnant, Menopausal patients that are completely anatomically normal. Um, complicated UTIs are, you know, UTIs in everyone else. So male patients are by definition complicated patients. Um, anybody with anatomical abnormalities, any pregnant patients, any patients with neurogenic bladder, diabetic patients, and elderly patients all fall into the complicated category because these are the people where just, you know, a three-day dose of Bactrim, let's say, may not be enough to treat their infection. So it's really important to kind of organize in your head which patients fall into the uncomplicated category and which patients fall into the complicated category because the treatment of these patients depends on, you know, the course of treatment really depends on which category they fall into. A few other important terms. So, you know, you can have, what is a recurring UTI? So a recurring UTI is two or more infections in a six month time period or three or more infections in 12 months. And you can have either a reinfection or you can have a persistent UTI. So a reinfection is basically a new event, okay? So you've treated the UTI and now the patient gets infected again, either by the same bacteria or a new bacteria. A persistent UTI is actually pretty rare. Um, that's a UTI that's never quite treated. And the bacteria is basically harbored somewhere in the body. So for example, patients that have large kidney stones can harbor bacteria 
inside the stone. And so those patients will often have persistent UTIs where, you know, no matter how much you treat them, they still harbor that bacteria. And the funny thing is that, as I said, persistent UTIs are actually pretty rare, but many patients come in to see me thinking they have a persistent UTI, thinking that they have some infection that's brewing in their body. And that's the reason that they keep getting recurring UTIs. So, you know, you have to kind of do some patient education because most people just have reinfections. So what are the risk factors for recurring UTIs? Anything with reduced urine flow, anytime urine gets hung up in the body, that is a risk factor. So men with BPH, women with prolapse that have, you know, urinary, some kind of incomplete emptying, um, men with strictures in their urethra and patients that don't have enough fluid intake. So if you're not drinking enough, you're probably not peeing enough. And if you're not peeing enough, that urine is just hanging out in the bladder waiting to get colonized with bacteria. There are also factors that promote colonization. So reduced estrogen states in women that are postmenopausal, spermicides can alter the pH of the vagina and just the microenvironment of the vagina. And again, promote colonization with bacteria, sexual activity, the movement of fluids that can harbor bacteria and being on an antibiotic puts you at a risk factor, at a risk for another UTI because you wipe out the good bacteria from the vagina and now there's room um, for you know bad bacteria basically to come in. That's what I tell my patients. But really it's again, that alteration of the microenvironment in the vagina and its own natural immune system that happens when you use antibiotics that predisposes you to more UTIs. And there's factors that basically, you know, facilitate the ascent of bacteria. So catheters are a big one, right? They put you at a risk for UTIs and incontinence. So what's my workup? So first of all, I try to figure out, you know, how many UTIs the patient is getting. And I look at everybody's cultures. You know, some people think they get recurring UTIs, but they actually don't have recurring UTIs. So a good example is a woman that has dysuria, so burning when she urinates after sexual intercourse. And sometimes women can get UTIs after sex, but a lot of times this can be just pelvic floor dysfunctions, just pelvic muscle spasm that happens after sex. So you really have to look at some cultures. You, you know, you don't need to have every culture that, you know, every time they've had a UTI, but you need to get some cultures in to know that these patients are actually getting real infections. Um, I ask patients about symptoms. I ask them about associated factors. So this is, you know, a big one, the risk factors. Are you using spermicides? Are you overwashing and overwiping? Um, are you douching? You know, sexual activity, just, you know, the frequency of it. Um, uh, birth control pill use. Sometimes birth control pills can um, decrease vaginal estrogen and testosterone levels and alter, again, that environment in the vagina. Incontinence, constipation. What other urinary symptoms does the patient have? Do they have overactive bladder? or incomplete emptying symptoms. Um, and then I talk to patients about their fluid intake. That's really important um, just to figure out how much are they actually drinking per day? Are they drinking enough so that are they peeing enough? And then I examine my patients. It's a really, really simple exam. And I think that anyone that has recurrent UTIs needs to be examined. Um, so I basically look for you know prolapse, which is super easy. You'll see it if it's significant enough. Um, and then I look for any kind of, you know, urethral lesions. So do they have a urethral diverticulum, which would basically kind of look like a cyst right by their urethra. And then I look for signs of vaginal atrophy um, post-menopause. And then the last thing I do is I check a PBR in all these patients. So I, I like to check you know, are they emptying completely? Now I have a bladder scanner in the office. So it's really easy for me to check a PBR, all of my patients, obviously, you know, even the 25 year olds, but in reality, you know, most 25 year old healthy patients or 30 or 35 year old healthy patients empty their bladder just fine. So, you know, there's a lot that a primary care physician can do in their office and, you know, not check their PBR as long as, you know, they don't have any urinary complaints. So what about the urine analysis and the culture? So our guidelines actually say that a clean catch midstream specimen is ideal. Um, you want to send it for culture. If 
that clean catch specimen comes back contaminated and the patient is symptomatic, then I always get a catheterized sample. So I actually tell the patient to come in and I get a sample with a catheter to see, you know, do they have any infection for, or not? Now, this is something interesting, and I wanted to talk about my last point here on the slide, uh, because this is something that I actually just recently learned as a urologist. Um, so traditionally, we use 10 to the fifth CFUs to diagnose a UTI, right? And that's how I learned it. But in reality, there's actually been some really good data recently that have, has shown that in symptomatic women, only 10 to the second CFUs of a single gram negative uropathogen. So you really don't need a lot, maybe the appropriate cutoff for patients that are symptomatic. So, um, and this was a study that was uh, published in um, JAMA a little while ago that basically showed, sorry, not in JAMA, New England Journal of Medicine in uh, 2013 that showed this. And what's interesting is that um, a lot of the labs will actually not report that low of counts of a bacteria. So sometimes, you know, you get that UA that's super, super positive and the patient has symptoms of a UTI and you treat them before you get your culture back and then the culture comes back no growth. Well, why is that? Well, I think this may, may be the reason, you know, I think it's worth finding out, um, you know, what is your lab's cutoff? for, you know, for a positive culture? Like at what point do they actually report growth? Um, and so I thought this was an interesting point to share with everyone because I think this is an important point um, that if you don't need a lot of bacteria to actually get symptoms of a UTI where you need to be treated. So what about cystoscopy and imaging? So our guidelines basically say that cystoscopy where we look in the bladder and an ultrasound is not routinely recommended for the workup in an uncomplicated recurrent UTI case, okay? Now, um, what's interesting is when patients have recurrent UTIs, you always want to rule out it being a complicated UTI, right? Like you want to rule out any obvious causes for the infection. And so I personally do think that it's important to get an imaging study. Like I think it's important to get at least a renal ultrasound. It's risk-free, it's easy, you know, it's cheap. So I think it's important to rule out any large kidney stones in patients or bladder diverticulum where urine can get hung up. If a patient has a history, let's say of any GYN or GU surgery, then I think it's important to look at their bladder and make sure there's no mesh or foreign body or sutures in the bladder. Um, now, cystoscopy, where we look in the bladder, is indicated if there is blood in the urine. So let's say the patient has had blood in the urine and they've had a UTI, and then a month later, there's still blood in the urine. Those are the patients where I definitely will look in their bladder. And then, as I said, the other patient population that I will look in their bladder is if they've had any surgery in their pelvis. Then I will look in their bladder as well, looking for any foreign bodies or anything abnormal in the bladder. Um, but the thing is that all these things, both cystoscopy and imaging, does tend to be low yield. Like it's not that often that I actually find, you know, something that's very treatable. Um, now, a lot of studies have actually shown that, you know, cystoscopy is very low yield, especially when the imaging is negative. And this was actually a study that I did when I was in fellowship with my mentor, um, Kim Cooper, who's like the guru of UTIs in New York. And we basically looked at, um, we looked at women with recurrent UTIs and we, we, you know, we looked at all patients where we did a cystoscopy and we did an ultrasound. And we basically found that, um, you know, only 3.8% of patients had findings on their cystoscopy when their imaging was negative, okay? So when the imaging is normal, cystoscopy will be normal in 94% of cases. So, you know, I definitely don't do cystoscopy on my patients, on all of my patients that have recurrent UTIs. I'm very, very selective about it. Um, so, how to prevent recurrent UTIs. So here, here, here's really, you know, the meat and potatoes of this talk. So how do, you know, what do I tell my patients? 
The first thing is behavioral modification. This is super, super important to go over with your patients. So you want to minimize those risk factors. So when it comes to sex, avoiding spermicide use, avoiding any anal to vaginal movement. And I actually used to not ask my patients that question, but I had a woman that, um, that I was trying to figure out why she keeps getting UTIs. And then like, you know, on our second visit or maybe even third visit, I found out that she was, you know, having anal intercourse and then vaginal intercourse. And so, you know, it was one of those things that really taught me a lesson to always mention that to my patients. Um, I always um, tell my patients to make sure but they're peeing before and after sex. And then the other thing I tend to tell my patients is to drink a glass, a large glass of water after sexual activity, because I want them to go and urinate one more time in the middle of the night to just get that bladder flushed out. Um, when it comes to tight fitting pants and thong underwear, you know, there's no real data on this stuff. But again, just thongs probably facilitate the movement of bacteria a little bit more than normal underwear. And so I mentioned that to my patients and tell them to, you know, do whatever they want to do with that information. So there was actually a study, this was published in JAMA um, recently in 2018, which showed that increasing daily water intake in patients that do not tend to drink a lot really does help with prevention of UTIs. And so this is, um, this is, talked about in our guidelines. And so I definitely wanted to talk about this study. Uh, basically they took women who were premenopausal that were drinking less than a liter and a half of water daily on average about 1.1 liters a day. And they added 1.5 liters of daily fluid intake to you know, one group of the patients and the others they did not. And they basically showed that there was definitely a decrease in UTIs over that one year in the patients who were drinking more water. And so, you know, their conclusion was that increased fluid intake is effective. And so I always tell my patients that you should be drinking about two liters, you know, healthy patients, I tell them you should be drinking about two liters of fluid a day, at least, you know, two, two and a half liters of fluid daily. So, all right, so here's one of the first guidelines that talks about, you know, prevention of UTIs. And this says clinicians may offer cranberry prophylaxis for women with recurring UTIs. And this is straight out of our guidelines as one of the recommendations. And before these guidelines came out, so before 2019, like the year before, nobody was really talking about cranberry. But as soon as these guidelines came out, now everybody started talking about cranberry in the open. Um, so why, right? So let's talk about cranberry. So cranberries basically contain these packs, proanthocyanidins. There are these organic compounds that basically prevent the adhesion of bacteria to the bladder wall, okay? And previously, and this is really, you know, the problem, previously, the trials that were done on cranberry were all over the place. There was no standardization, low doses of um, cranberry, pro uh, cranberry products with low doses of packs were used. And so, you know, there was really no good data on cranberry. And so, you know, nobody could really make any recommendations. And most clinicians were saying that, yeah, there's no data behind cranberry. Forget about that cranberry juice. However, recently, cranberry has been the, study, uh, the subject of a lot of good randomized clinical trials. And so now we have good data with enough of these packs to actually have an effect um, and so we have at least six RCTs that compare cranberry to placebo, and we have at least two RCTs comparing cranberry to daily antibiotics, okay? And the results are very good. So these are studies that used capsules, beverages, powder form, but these studies used a standardized dosing of cranberry. And so we knew exactly how many packs were present in the you know, pill or in the beverage that was given to the patients. And a pooled analysis that was done by the AUA of six of the six RCTs of cranberry versus placebo basically showed that cranberry does reduce UTI incidence by about 37%. So that's really huge. And so that's why this is in our guidelines because now we have enough data and it's good data to show that cranberry has a role in UTI prevention. Okay. 
Now, the, another interesting thing is they, the two studies basically showed that there's no difference in UTI rate when comparing daily cranberry versus daily antibiotic, which is also huge. So let's just look at, you know, a few of the um, studies. So this was basically the biggest trial that was done. 373 subjects, multi-center, double-blind, randomized control study. They basically gave people cranberry juice containing 41 milligrams of packs. And then they were giving the other group a, a beverage that tasted just like cranberry juice. And the 240 mLs of cranberry juice reduced the incidence of UTIs by 31% over 24 months. And this is probably the largest study and the best study that was done. Now, what about cranberry versus trimethoprim? So this was a study, also randomized controlled trial in older women, older than 45 years old. Um, so many of them were postmenopausal, 137 women. They gave a cranberry capsule, 500 milligrams. It contained 36 milligrams of packs versus TMP, 100 milligrams daily for six months. And there was no difference in UTI rate or time to first UTI between the two arms, okay? So again, this is really, really huge because you could be giving people cranberry instead of an antibiotic daily. And so, you know, to me, that really means a lot. Now, what about methanamine, okay? So methanamine is basically... Um, a, a compound that's converted to formaldehyde and ammonia in acidic environment. And traditionally, this is what we use. This is what we all used as urologists for prevention of recurring UTIs. Now, methanamine does not make it into our guidelines. And the reason it does not make it into our guidelines is because the studies on methanamine are really, really poor. Okay, so first of all, just a little intro about methanamine kind of going back. So you need the urine to be acidic in order for the methanamine to actually be effective. So I, when I you know, prescribe it, I always prescribe it with vitamin C twice a day, 500 milligrams twice a day with methanamine, with Hiprex one gram twice a day. Not a lot of side effects with it. There has really been no resistance seen and the one thing to keep in mind is that it can precipitate if the patient is taking Bactrim and they're taking methanamine at the same time, it can precipitate in the urine. And it's ineffective with, you know, if the patient is taking anything that will alkalinize the urine because it will just not become formaldehyde. It won't, you know, become the bacteriostatic agent that it needs to be. So again, the problem with methanamine is there may be some efficacy and a lot of people find that it's effective for their patients patients, including myself, sometimes it is effective, but it's not in our guidelines because the studies are just really poor quality. Only two of the 13 studies actually used urinary acidification. So they weren't even, you know, giving methanamine to their patients properly. Okay. So maybe if the urine would have been acidified and, you know, the other 11 studies, it would have been shown to be effective, but it wasn't. Um, there was a variety of doses used and there and many studies didn't even define what a UTI was. And so it may be effective. The conclusion is it may be effective. We don't know. It's not in our guidelines, um, but it's, it's an option for the patients in practical use. Now, what about D-mannose? So D-mannose is actually, it's, it, this is an exciting um, agent because D-mannose is a type of sugar that basically binds to type 1 pili in E. coli and possibly other bacteria as well. And it prevents the adhesion of the bacteria to the urothelium. And actually, so this is a study from 2020, a systemic review published in a well-regarded journal that basically concluded that D mannose appears effective, sorry, protective in women with recurring UTIs and possibly even similar to antibiotic prophylaxis. So I think we're all kind of excited to see what happens with D-mannose. D-mannose is also not in our guidelines, but I think it may be in the future uh, because there were two very interesting studies. One basically compared two grams of D-mannose to 50 milligrams of nitrofurantoin daily to placebo, and the incidence of UTIs was the lowest with D-mannose. It was even lower than daily nitrofurantoin. So that's pretty great. 
And then there was another study um, that compared D-mannose daily to Bactrim, but the Bactrim was really underdosed because they were giving people one week a month of Bactrim. So every month they would give patients a week of Bactrim. Um, and here there were actually less infections with D-mannose than in the Bactrim group. And so, you know, I think d is something that um, has some interesting data, some good data, um, uh, you know, on it. And I think that that's definitely an option for patients with recurring UTIs, but it is not in our guidelines, but I do use it. So what about probiotics? Um, probiotics, there's really not enough data for recommendation. It's not in our guidelines. There are three placebo controlled um, trials basically comparing vaginal lactobacillus to placebo, and um, there was no difference in UTI recurrence. But there was one study that looked at oral lactobacillus versus an antibiotic, and the rate of UTIs in both groups was actually lower. The rate of UTIs in the antibiotic group was lower than the one in the probiotic group. But the problem is that the antibiotic group had a huge, huge resistance rate. And so, you know, it's great that there were less UTIs on the patient, in the patients that were on Bactrim, but they literally saw, you know, resistant organisms as early as two weeks into the prophylactic antibiotic use. And so, you know, like in my mind, that's really not an option because I want to prevent, you know, resistant organisms in my patients. Um, so oral lactobacillus, Maybe, maybe an option in patients with recurring UTIs, but we definitely, definitely need more data. So another you know, statement on our guidelines basically talks about peri and postmenopausal women. And in these patients, clinician, clinicians really should recommend vaginal estrogen therapy to reduce the risk of UTIs if there's no contraindication to the estrogen therapy. So you know, what's vaginal estrogen all about? So vaginal estrogen basically increases the production of glycogen in vaginal epithelial cells. And what happens is the, the lactobacillus thrives on the glycogen. And so th there's an increase in lactobacillus levels um, after vaginal estrogen use. There's a decrease in vaginal pH. So there's basically this restoration of the microbiome of the vagina in patients that are using vaginal estrogen, the tissue becomes healthier, you know, the immune system of the, of the vagina probably becomes better. And there's more lactobacillus with vaginal estrogen use. And so there's many ways um, to apply by the estrogen, you can give it in a cream form. There's a ring that just sort of stays in for three months. There's little tablets that you can um, insert into the vagina. And the side effects of estrogen, basically local irritation from the cream. Sometimes we do see that. And occasionally women have some breast tenderness uh, with vaginal estrogen use. And so in those patients, I tell them to you know stop it. But, um, but it's very rare to really see any side effects. So there are multiple, multiple trials basically showing that vaginal estrogen is very effective in UTI prevention. The Cochrane Review in 2008 looked at nine uh, randomized control trials. Vaginal estrogen was safe and effective for UTI prevention. Oral estrogen was not effective for UTI prevention. So my patients that are taking oral estrogen, I tell them that they really need local vaginal estrogen as well. So I will put them on, you know, vaginal estrogen in addition to their oral estrogen if they're getting recurrent UTIs. And there's really no difference as far as prevention of UTIs when it comes to application methods. So you can do the ring, you can do the cream, all of them are equally effective. Now, you know, we think that there's really minimal absorption of the um, estrogen into the bloodstream. So a lot of patients will come in and they think like I'm trying to kill them because, uh, you know, they look at all the warnings on the estrogen and they go online and they read about vaginal estrogen and they come back and they tell me, you know, are you crazy? I'm not using this. And so you have to educate the patients. And so I always tell them that when they looked at blood levels of estradiol, um, in women that are using vaginal estrogen, there was really no increase in levels of estradiol versus the group that was on placebo. So, 
you know, so there really shouldn't be much vaginal estrogen absorption into the blood. Okay. Um, and there, you know, the studies really do show that there's no, you know, increase in recurrence or progression um, of, you know, of breast cancer in women that have a history of breast cancer. But obviously, you know, I always talk to the, you know, I always make sure that patients check with their oncologist if they do have a history of breast cancer that it's okay to use vaginal estrogen and honestly most of the time they say that it's okay it's very rare for them to say that they cannot use vaginal estrogen and so this is just the little table of you know um the dosing because people always even urologists you know, at our urology meetings, we're always asking each other, you know, what's the dosing? So if you're going to put people on S-Trace cream, I tell them to use it basically one to two grams daily for two weeks, and then twice a week after that. So you want to get their levels kind of up, and then you want them to be using it about twice a week after that. And I tell patients that you really need about two to three months to see the effects of vaginal estrogen. So you have to tell people what the expectations are. And then as far as the ring, the ring goes in and it stays in for three months um, and releases a little bit of estrogen into the system. So that needs to be changed every three months. And if they're using Premarin, that's 0.5 grams daily for two weeks and then twice a week after that. So we used to tell people to just put a little pea size amount and put a little bit, and now we know it's safe. So we tell people to use the gram or, you know, the half a gram when it comes to Premarin. So you want to use the whole, you know, amount. Okay, so um, next. So this is another one of our guidelines, and this basically talks about antibiotic prophylaxis. And they say that following the discussion of risks and benefits and alternatives, clinicians may prescribe antibiotic prophylaxis to decrease the risk of future UTIs in women of all ages, okay, with recurring UTIs. So this is really my last resort. There's multiple, multiple studies that did show that daily antibiotics reduce the recurrence of UTIs in pre- and postmenopausal women. However, a lot of these studies are super old. So that's the first thing. Second of all, there's really a lot of, you know, adverse events when it comes to, you know, recurrent chronic antibiotic use. Um, nitrofurantoin uh, really should not be used in patients with a GFR of less than 30. And the last thing is once the antibiotics are stopped, the UTIs actually return to the same rate as the placebo group. So it's not like, you know, a lot of patients think you're like curing them, but you're not curing them because as soon as you stop the antibiotics, now they're getting UTIs again. So they really have to be on a sort of lifelong, um, so, you know, what are the options if you're interested? These, you know, these here are the different options for daily antibiotics as prophylaxis. Um, the AUA really does talk about using it in the short term, like no more than three to 12 months and then see what happens with the patient. Um, and then the other option is postcoital. Now, this is something that I do use in some of my patients. Um, you know, basically just giving a postcoital, like, so after sexual activity or right before sexual activity, you're giving them one dose of antibiotic, um, to prevent, you know, to prevent the infection. Now, the one thing that I do want to say is that I use the, the daily prophylaxis in probably about, I would say 2%, 2 to 5% of my patients. So 95% of my patients, I manage in one of the other ways that I talked about today. Um, so I really, really do not use this daily antibiotic prophylaxis for a lot of patients. And then postcoital, you know, maybe, I don't know, 10% of my patients, my young patients that are sexually active. So I don't even use that a lot. Um, the one thing that I do do with my patients that are sexually active and um, tend to get UTIs after sex is first, I will try to tell them, take an extra cranberry pill right after sex. So first I start with that and that's effective for a lot of people. And if, that, if that's not effective and if their UTIs are only associated with sex, then I'll go to the antibiotic. All right, so what do I do in my practice? Kind of in a nutshell, I get a urine analysis, a urine culture on, you know, on my patients, I get an ultrasound. 
I check their PDR. Again, I don't think it's absolutely necessary to get a PDR on everybody, but I have the bladder scanner and these patients are being referred to me. And so I think it's important for me to get a PDR on the patients. But if you're a primary and you're seeing these people and they have no feelings of incomplete emptying and their exam is normal, they don't really need a PDR unless it's a male patient. And then I think male patients really do need a post void residual to make sure that they're emptying. But you can get that just from the ultrasound. So if you order an ultrasound on the patient and ask, please measure PDR, the, you know, the, the ultrasound tech will tell you where their PDR is. So you don't need to have a bladder scanner. You could get it from the ultrasound. Um, and by the way, this is not just for the uncomplicated patient. This is what I do for all of my patients that see me with recurrent UTIs, all of them, my male patients, my female patients, postmenopausal, young women. This is what I do for everyone. And even though the AUA guidelines talk about, you know, uncomplicated, they, they really don't because they also talk about the postmenopausal woman that, you know, needs estrogen. So that's already complicated by definition. And so this really does pertain to everybody. So I get a urine analysis, a urine culture and an ultrasound. I get a PDR. I check for prolapse or any obvious abnormalities around the urethra. And then I go over healthy bladder habits. So hydration, no spermicides, no douching, avoiding thongs if possible, drinking and peeing after sex and wiping front to back, okay? Then I start everybody on a good cranberry pill. So a good cranberry pill means that it has to have at least 36 milligrams of packs in it. And that is sort of the standard in the urological community. It doesn't matter if it's a thousand milligrams of cranberry or 500 milligrams of cranberry or 2000, it has to have 36 milligrams of packs. I use Utiva, that's why I'm giving the talk today. And I will tell you guys why I use Utiva, but, um, but that's really important to have them start a good cranberry pill. And then as far as vaginal estrogen, well, if they're postmenopausal and on an exam, they have a ton of atrophy, then I will kind of try to convince them to start vaginal estrogen right away. If they don't have a lot of atrophy, then I usually do kind of a stepwise. People really like to take things step by step. So, you know, I tell people, hey, let's start with the cranberry. I'll see you in three months. And if you're still getting UTIs, then we'll, we'll do the vaginal estrogen. So I kind of tend to do that, I think, more often than not, unless the patient has just really bad vaginal atrophy. And then I see these people in three months. If they're doing well, I graduate them to six months, and then I graduate them to 12 months. Um, but if they continue to have infections, then I continue to see them every three months until I get them on track. And then I will try other things. So I'll try D-manos. That's probably the first thing I would try next. I would add D-manos to the cocktail that they're already on. I would then try methanamine if, you know, if that's not working. And then as last resort, I would probably try the probiotic orally. Now, you know, why am I here speaking for Utiva, right? Well, because like I said, not all cranberry pills are, you know, created equal. So when I got out into practice, you know, I was taught that, you know, the patients need 36 milligrams of packs. And there's basically, um, you know, a few brands that I know out there that have 36 milligrams of packs. Now, you know, you want, but there's constantly data that's coming out on this. And there's a researcher at Rutgers, her name is Amy Howell. She's sort of like the queen of UTIs. And she does a lot of studies on different brands looking at the anti-adhesion properties of the different cranberry pills out there. So she basically published an article saying that, hey, not all cranberry pills are the, are the same. And a lot of cranberry pills that claim to be great and look nice in the package um, are actually have, basically no efficacy as far as UTI prevention. And so this is a nice little chart that basically shows the measurement of um, the measurement of packs in different cranberry products. And as you could see, like the Swiss natural doesn't even have any packs in them. And then the Utiva has, you know, 39 milligrams of packs. So it's potent enough and it has very good anti-adhesion activity versus the other pills that are out there on the market that you can buy do not have much anti-adhesion activity. So, you know, this is why I use Utiva because I like, you know, I like the brand um, and because I 
I think they have a really good product. And because I truly think it works for my patients, you know, I've been using it now for seven years. It works very, very well. Um, so this is the study that this lady, Amy Howell, basically did. And Utiva works with her and they basically test their product with her. And she showed that, you know, there's different brands of cranberry. Some of them have no anti-adhesion activity at all. And then others like Utiva has very, very strong anti-adhesion activity. And so that's why I use this cranberry pill as opposed to others. Um, the other thing that they're actually finding out about these days, and this is very interesting, is that it seems, and this was presented at our AUA meeting this year, is that it's really the soluble packs that you need. So sometimes there are cranberry pills that will say we have 36 milligrams of packs, but those um, compounds are basically coming from the stems and the seeds and the skins, and those packs the insoluble ones do not really have any anti-adhesion activity. And so you need the stuff that comes from the cranberry juice. And so again, I trust the Utiva. I know they have a good product, but I don't know, you know, I'm not sure what's going on with the other products because many of them are sort of fake. So, all right. So this is sort of the whole line of products. That's another reason that I use Utiva because they have a lot of the different things that you know I recommend to my patients. So they have D-manos, um, so patients can get you know whatever they need in one sort of spot, and they have probiotics as well. Obviously, probiotics are good for patients that have um, you know a, 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 any any infection basically. So they they can definitely be used while a patient has a UTI to restore their vaginal flora and their gut flora. And then they also have the gummies um, for you know younger patients um, or patients that don't want to swallow pills. And so and so this is sort of their line of product. The one thing I'll say is it, it, it this Amy Howell lady basically showed that you don't want to use D manos with the cranberry pill together because it actually decreases the anti-adhesion activity. So you want to use, if you're going to be giving people cranberry pills, you want to space it out. So you do one in the morning, let's say, and then one, the D-manos in the, in the evening. And so you don't want to put the D-manos with the cranberry pill together. Um, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Barbalat. That was a, that was a great talk. Um, you know what? We, uh, we have a lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> I'll be honest. I, I don't know if we're going to get through. We, we are not going to get through all of them, but we'll okay. save them and, uh, and we'll see how we can adjust them from, from uh, we can adjust them after, but okay. we have all the questions saved. So I'm going to just jump right into it. Cause literally we have maybe like 12 minutes we can do for questions. We'll push it as long as we can go. Okay. Yep. Let's do it. All right. Uh, and jump right into this here. First question. Hold on, I'm just going to move spotlight. Okay, so first question. Uh, I often see patients who have been treated symptomatically for UTIs, but not confirmed by a urine culture. Often it's tricky to define, to define these, and they could be classed as recurrent or just misdiagnosed. Do you have any advice here on how to move along? So, you know, those are the patients that sometimes I will get a catheterized specimen. So, you know, as I said in the presentation, I'm starting to kind of almost change the way I see these things. And I think it's an evolving field. Sometimes the lab will say no growth, but there is actually a UTI, you know, but if it's truly, you know, you've gotten a catheterized specimen on the patient and it still, you know, does not grow anything out then it could be pelvic floor dysfunction. You know, that's another big diagnosis in patients that present like UTIs, but are actually not having UTIs. So, um, and then there are some people that will have true UTI sometimes. And then other times they just feel like they have a UTI because that area in their body is sort of sensitive. So, mm. yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, hey, Dr. Barbalad, do you want to stop sharing your screen? Then our, oh, sure, our video might uh, be a little bigger for everyone, just in case. All right, one second. Um, where is you share? Paul share. Stop share. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Is there actually evidence for voiding before and after sex? You know, I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think there's evidence, but it's sort of just common agreements. I feel like between most urologists. Okay. Sounds good. Um, okay. This one's a little longer 
44 year old female with recurrent UTIs only after sexual intercourse, about 10 per year for, oh, times 10 years. 10, it's been going on for 10 years. Always voids before and after, drinks lots of water, no anal sex, never had UTIs until she went in a hot tub and had sex after from then on, gets UTIs with almost every episode of sex. New patient, so no cultures available, but patient adamant she gets severe UTIs, very painful and resolves quickly with macrobid. Now takes 100 milligram macrobid just prior or after sex and doesn't get them with that treatment. Is this the best and only option for her? You know, so no, I, it's, so these patients are kind of interesting because you'll have these patients that come into the office and they already know what's working for them and they just want that refill. And so a lot of times I'll, I'll say, okay, you know, that's fine. If that's what works for you, I'm not going to be like judging you. It's your body. I do tell these patients that, you know, you know, you don't want to be using antibiotics, all the risks of resistance, et cetera. I counsel them, but a lot of times that's what they know works for them. Um, but I do always tell the patients that, hey, you know, one thing I would try before we go there is for you to just take a cranberry pill after sexual activity. Let's try that for, you know, a month or two, you know, I'll see you in six weeks and see how that's worked. And if it's not working, then we'll do the, you know, then we'll do the macrobit. I'm happy to prescribe it in that case. So I try to kind of compromise, but you know, I think that usually works. Okay. Thanks. All right. What is the best method for urine sample collection for older women over 80 years old? Straight catheter or clean catch? We often have clean catch samples contaminated because they cannot really clean well prior to giving a sample. Yeah, definitely. If you're getting, you know, if you, I, I would give it a chance with a clean catch because obviously nobody wants to be catheterized, but, um, but a lot of times I end up doing, if they have a contamination, I end up either bringing them back for a catheterized sample or sometimes um, what I'll do is when I examine the patient for the very first time, while I examine them, I just tell them, you know, I'm going to get a quick, a catheterized sample because I don't want to have to bring them back. So if it's convenient while I examine them to just get a catheterized sample, I do that. It adds like literally 30 seconds to, you know, the visit. And then I know I get a good sample. Okay. Um, from your knowledge, are PACs, the proanthocyanidins, are they bacteriostatic? You know, I would say, I guess, right? So they, they prevent adhesion of bacteria and then you pee out the bacteria. So they don't kill the bacteria. I think they basically just prevent it from invading your bladder wall. And that's from our knowledge as well. Just yeah. doesn't stop. And, you know, and I think that this is the cool thing about, about UTIs. Like we're literally learning this stuff in real time right now. And we're seeing kind of what works and it does work. And so I think this is like the really cool thing about the field of recurring UTIs, which doesn't seem to be so cool really, but it is. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, I work in the surgical quality data world. Po Post-operative UTIs are an ongoing issue at our site. Is there any benefit to tracking specific uropathogens per UTI event, i.e. E. coli versus ESBL? You know, I'm not sure. I think like there must be a reason why these patients, you know, perhaps they have catheters in for a long time. So I don't know if it's really worth tracking the actual uropathogen as opposed to, you know, some of the risk, some of the similar risk factors that could be going on, even how the catheters are inserted during surgery, making sure that they're inserted in a, you know, in a, with sterile technique and everything. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure that the exact uropathogen really needs to be monitored as opposed to, you know, the risk factors. Okay. Um, what about prevention strategies for men and individuals with indwelling catheters? So, you know, that's difficult, obviously, because when somebody has an indwelling catheter, that's a huge risk factor. So one thing is, if you could try to get them to do CIC, that's the number one prevention. So if somebody cannot urinate and they have a catheter, if you could get them to do CIC, that would be better. But otherwise, I sort of honestly, I use the same prevention we don't have you know it's not there's not a whole lot I also put them on a cranberry pill um, sometimes I tell them rather than you know having a catheter in the penis it may be a better idea to have one in the belly although studies really haven't shown that that decreases infection but it would make sense that it would um, 
And so, um, so that's, you can't really use methenamine because methenamine works best when there's actually urine collecting in the bladder as opposed to the bladder being empty. So you, the methenamine isn't really an option in these patients. Um, that's basically it. Okay. And you gotta get the catheter out. Yes, yes, for sure. Okay, would you recommend uh, Utiva for my diabetic patients who have recurrent UTIs related to their medications? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, I think Utiva is basically, or, you know, any cranberry product, I think it's safe, um, really minimal side effects, and, and it makes sense. There's good data to support it. So I would definitely use it for complicated patients as well. Uh, okay, we have five minutes, so I'm going to keep uh, piling through here. Can a patient clear a UTI without antibiotics by taking cranberry? If symptoms resolved in 24 hours and patient refused to take antibiotics despite a positive culture and UA, is that okay? Yes, it is okay. And so actually, this is one of the, sli one of the slides I cut out in the interest of time, but Basically, patients, about one third of patients can clear their UTI without using antibiotics. And, you know, the data shows that it's, there's not much danger to it. There's really not a lot of like pyelonephritis or sepsis that results in that. So if you drink a lot of fluid, if you take a cranberry pill, there's definitely a portion of patients that can clear their infections. It may just take a little longer than with an antibiotic. Okay. Um... Does d help with non-E. coli UTIs? So, you know, I think that we are, mostly we study E. coli, but we think that it may actually be helpful um, in non-E. coli UTIs as well. So I would try it. Okay. Uh, please clarify if Utiva would be effective if dosed pre or post-coital rather than daily for those patients who only get cystitis with sex on an infrequent basis? You know, I think you have to sort of try it out. Um, I tend to tell my patients to take the Utiva every single day. And if they get uh, infections after sex, then I tell them to take an extra pill. But, you know, but if the patient says, I've had actually patients that have said, oh, you know, it's too expensive. I don't want to use it daily. Then I say, okay, that's fine you know, try it after sex only, see if that works. If that doesn't work, then try it every day. You know, I think the thing about UTIs is it's really a lifestyle issue, right? It's just a big, big nuisance. So, um, so for most patients. And so I think it's worth just trying different things as long as you see the patient back, you know, in a month or six weeks so that they feel like you're actually doing something for them. Okay. Um, do you know if there is a study that patients with urinary catheters, example, ICU patients, can be given cranberry pills as prophylaxis to prevent catheter-associated UTIs? I think there were definitely studies that uh, looked at that, that looked at using cranberry. I'm not sure if they were completed or published, actually, but possibly. I have to look into it. I think there are studies actually showing that. We are familiar with one study that was published in the Canadian Journal of Urology, uh, and, and we can look that up and pass that on to the audience as well. Yeah, I know when I was at Columbia, they were actually looking at CAUTI, like catheter-associated infections and using cranberry pills, but I'm not sure if they actually ended up doing the study, but they were definitely looking into it. Okay. Hey, we'll, we'll cut this off at two more questions, okay? okay? Last two questions here. I have a patient who has not been helped <laughs> I have a patient who is not being helped in Toronto by urologists. Uh, and she found a urologist in the US who says she has bacteria trapped in a biofilm. How should she be managed? She is on Utiva and Dimanos. You know, this is one of those like persistent infections questions. You know, I don't know if the patient has like a stent in or a foreign body, then I could see that. But otherwise, I don't really, I don't really, I guess, believe in biofilms in the bladder. Like, I don't think there's bacteria that's trapped underneath the mucosa somewhere. And um, one of the things you can do for those patients is you can treat them. And right after treatment, you could get a PCR test on their urine. There's now like PCR tests that are available that are very, very sensitive to many atypical bacteria and things like that. And so that can either prove to the patient that they have absolutely, you know, no bacteria 
or, you know, or that there is something maybe that's still present. Okay. All right. Um, we're, we're, this is the last question. Uh, what about BPV? Since my older population has many times more than the younger population, does VAGFEM lower that vaginal pH? Does, yeah, um, okay, you want to, I'll read that again, okay? <laughs> what about BPV? Okay. Since my older population has many times more than the younger population. <clears throat> you know what, I can skip that question. Yeah, so let's <laughs> skip it. I don't okay. know what BPV is. <laughs> okay. Confused okay. about relationship of vagina with flow of urine. Vagina versus urethra. Yes. So the vagina is what has all the bacteria in it and the urethra is right there. So the vaginal bacteria basically gets in to the urethra that's right there in the area. And so if the vagina, kind of the microbiome, the, the, the whole little environment of the vagina is thrown off for whatever reason, um, age, recent antibiotic use, et cetera, then there's no protection really for the urethra um, and bad bacteria can basically come in and dominate. Uh, again, I, I just want to thank you for taking the time to do the talk for us. And, uh, you know, uh, Jyoti is here, who's part of our, our healthcare professional team as well. I uh, just wanted to, uh, to thank you and thank everyone for attending, but please hang out everyone else. Uh, we're going to do the raffle right after. Dr. Barbalat, any last words? No, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And this was a lot of fun. Awesome. Thanks so much. Bye. Yeah, bye. Okay. These slides, you know, we don't actually share any of the speaker slides, but we will share the recording, which will be live on our feed later on. Uh, Utiva products are non-prescription. They are all natural products in the U.S. They are uh, considered dietary supplements. In Canada, they are natural health products. All right. So just a quick run through here. Uh, just going to do a quick look at our at our products. So on the left, we have a diagnostic product. That's just our UTI test strips, test for leukocytes and nitrite kind of thing you can get OTC over the counter. Our main product that Dr. Barbalat was talking about is the cranberry packs. So it's the number number two here. Uh, there was a lot of questions about postcoital or, uh, or daily prevention. Each capsule of Utiva cranberry packs gives you 36 milligrams of cranberry packs. It's a 240 milligram capsule. So it's a very, very small. It's probably one of the smallest capsules on the market. It gives you 36 milligrams of soluble packs. One a day is easy. It's simple. It's great for prevention of UTIs. Uh, we usually recommend two the day of and two the day after when it comes to sex associated or any kind of trigger associated UTI. Uh, it's about nine times more packs. You saw from that chart earlier compared to any other cranberry product that you can just get over the counter. Most products do not tell you if they have active molecules. It's just the way natural products are. Um, but again, the cranberry packs are what stick to bacteria and stop the bacteria from sticking. So when you urinate and you pee, it just creates that natural flushing effect. Uh, bonus as a cranberry product, it also has no vitamin K and very, very little oxalates. Usually cranberry products are high in vitamin K and have high oxalates, which can impact blood thinners and kidney stones. Utiva products we've made sure don't have any of this. Uh, the next most popular one I'll jump over here is D-Manos. Our D-Manos comes in 500 milligram capsules. A uh, question was asked earlier, all of our products are made in Canada. Uh, so it's all locally sourced and made. Uh, so pretty much the recommended D-Manos dose, as you saw from the presentation, is about 2,000 milligrams of D-Manos per day. So that's four capsules. Uh, usually that recommendation has been made from studies where they're only using D-Manos. There is evidence looking at potentially lower the amount of D-Manos per day if you're also taking a cranberry product. But one paper we have coming out is going to be looking at how taking D-Manos and cranberry packs at the same time can actually diminish the effect of the packs on cran uh, the diminish the effects of the cranberry to stop bacteria. So we currently recommend spacing it out, taking the cranberries in the evening and D-manos in the morning. So you're not taking them at the exact same time. And that paper should be coming out in the Q1, Q2 uh, of 2022. Uh, so again, um, all of our products are third-party tested for quality and locally made. Uh, D-manos is known to help against E. coli. 
there are, uh, you know, uh, cranberry packs are more known to go after a diverse range of bacteria. So uh, cranberry packs are often recommended more in, you know, can be recommended to anybody, but we see them heavily in postmenopausal females as well, just because of the diverse range of bacteria that they may, uh, may be having in their, they may be causing their infections. So our third other product are probiotics. So our probiotics are one capsule a day. Uh, it's, it's a formulated, it's a specially formulated strain that provides 30 billion CFU of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. Uh, some of the strains were selected primarily to help reduce the side effects of antibiotics, but more or less to improve gut and vaginal flora. So uh, it's shelf stable. They're easy to take. Uh, most, pro a lot of probiotics of high quality usually have to be refrigerated. These ones are shelf stable and it's easy for patients. The nice thing about the Utiva offering is that because we make all these three products, we offer bundled pricing. So, you know, for high quality products, they can be a little bit more pricey for patients. But with Utiva, we give like patient discounts, first order discounts, and we also bundle products together to make them a little bit more affordable and economical for, for the patients. Uh, last two, we have gummies. Gummies are for kids. Uh, people like don't take the capsules. Uh, you're getting about 18 milligrams of packs for every four gummies. It's very low in sugar. But, uh, you know, the most clinically efficacious option is still the capsules for once a day, 36 milligrams of packs. Uh, and then we have wipes. Uh, some, I'm sure some of you have seen UTI patients are very particular about anything that comes in contact with their, with their private areas, and they might not want to use toilet paper to wipe. These are just, these are not like COVID killing bacterial, antibacterial wipes. They're just regular sterile, uh, clean wipes that can be used anytime on the go. So it's just a convenience factor. But again, the main products we have, the cranberry packs, the probiotics, and a uh, D-manos. Uh, in Canada, these are all available in pharmacies, health food stores, uh, online portals. Our website is always the cheapest for patients, so we always ask people to come to our website. We ship right away, and, uh, and they can. it's the cheapest option for the patients because these are all mostly out-of-pocket uh, expenses. In the U.S., we're available. There are multiple medical clinics that actually carry Utiva to offer to the patients directly. It helps with compliance and because they're natural uh, OTC products, so they can do this. Also, uh, it's on Amazon and on our website in the U.S. as well. So again, the website is the cheapest option if you're not carrying it in your clinics. Um, after this talk, there will be a follow-up email that goes out. If you're interested in having any samples or products, uh, more product information, maybe for your clinic or your other uh, colleagues and associates, we'd be more than happy to, uh, to do like a quick like 15 minute talk um, to, your, uh, to your audience or to your clinic. So again, I, I thank you for your time. I'm just gonna take a quick peek in here <clears throat> into the questions, if there's anything I can address right away. Okay. I, I don't see anything. If, you, if anyone has any direct questions right now, I'll hang out for a minute. But, uh, oh, yeah, so I just see a question here about, is it available in all pharmacies? Not all pharmacies. Uh, in, in Canada, it's Rexall. Uh, Quebec is like uh, Jean Coutu, Family Pre. We're heavily available in Quebec. And on the West Coast, London Drugs, some PharmaSaves. It, it's pretty available, but the website is Utiva Health ca or utivahealth.com. All this information will be sent to everyone who attended uh, and uh, it will be in the email as well. Uh, are the capsules sugar-free? Yes, so we keep sugar extremely low. In these, we have nutritional facts for all of our products. Keep in mind, D-mannos is considered a naturally occurring sugar. It's supposedly, it doesn't increase your sugar levels, but uh, you know we offer it and it's often uh, provided based on the physician's uh, or the healthcare practitioner's discretion with these types of patients. <clears throat> well, and if a patient is given an RX, will any drug plans cover the cost? So unfortunately, these products are natural products and you know drug plans don't usually cover it. There are a few that will, uh, especially those that have, um, they're called uh, it's like a, uh, it's like a health, like kind of like a flex dollar account, but there's also health spending accounts that some companies have and they allot dollars to their employees or, or people that are part of the plan. And then they can write off some of these, but 
you know, majority of people will not usually have coverage for it, but it's always worth checking. We wish this, these products were covered because we've seen some great uh, benefits. Um, overall, I can say since we started, we've probably had a good at least 25,000 plus patients go on Utiva and at least 50 to 60% of them end up staying on because of the benefits that they're seeing. So anytime you can reduce your UTIs from say even five to eight a year and you can get down to one or no UTIs, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a huge benefit, especially in the reduction of antibiotic usage. Okay, if there's no other questions, I'm gonna end it here. <clears throat> Otherwise I could keep talking about this forever. If you have any questions, again, feel free to reply to the emails. And we thank everyone here for taking their time on a Monday night to join. And we hope you found that the talk was enjoyable and informative. And again, we apologize. We didn't get to all the Q&A, but we'll try and address them over email. Have a good night, everyone.